they express my deep appreciation and the joy that this church consistently brings to me. Anytime there's a crisis, this church is the first to respond, and what a huge blessing that that has been throughout um, my time overseas. So thank you. Um, so this story that I'm about to share actually is from my most recent trip, um, just probably a month ago, a month and a half ago, I was on the island of Guam. So I work in all of Micronesia, which is thousands of islands, um, the size of the contiguous United States. So it's huge. If you put all those islands into one landmass, it's smaller than the state of Rhode Island. So that gives you a visual, Micronesia. So on this particular trip, I was working on the island of Guam. And I was working specifically, or the primary target of my work while I was there. If you get my newsletter, you'll get more detail. I'll be sending it out on Tuesday, actually. If you don't get that and you want to get that, um, make sure you give me your email address. So I was doing a lot of counseling at Pacific Islands University, a Christian university uh, um, on the island of Guam. And I was doing a great amount of work with a young lady. I'm going to call her name Isa. I've changed a few details just to protect her identity. Uh, she was born with a developmental disorder uh, that forced her to, to, her eyesight was an issue and she walked with a cane. She also had severe epilepsy. And when she was in school, she would have multiple epileptic seizures a day, coupled with her developmental disorder, warranted her a personal one-on-one -on -one aid. So this aid, instead of being a good thing, she had the same aid all the way through high school, ends up being abusive, both verbally and somewhat physically. The other thing that happened to Isa is she was severely bullied, and this aid would uh, encourage the bullying that she experienced. Um, she also, she, there's multiple layers of trauma for this young lady. She was not from the island of Guam. She was from one of the smaller islands that are next to Guam. And it happened to be an island that is the hated people, uh, different ethnicity from the Guam people. So she also was experiencing bullying because of her ethnicity. She was also experiencing discrimination and prejudice from staff and uh, peers and administration. So again, we've got another layer of trauma. Added to all of this, if that weren't enough, Issa also um, comes from a culture where you do not have intimate conversations. This is pretty much true all through Micronesia. Uh, which is why there's a lot of um, suicide, an extremely high rate of suicide there. It's one of the contributing factors. You do not have intimate conversations with your parents. So there is a, um, when you talk, so I'll just give you a, a something that to me immediately gives you an idea of what that relationship would be like. When you're talking with your parents or a person that you respect, a person of authority, you do not look at them in the eyes. You look at the ground or their feet. So right there, like how much intimacy do you think is going to be between a child and an adult when you have that kind of dynamic that, is take place, that takes place? So Issa's in all this pain. She's being bullied severely and has multiple levels of, of trauma and bullying happening, and she has no one to talk to. So finally, she works up the courage and decides, I'm going to go and talk to my mother. So she goes, she talks to her mother and tells her what's going on. And her mother discounted what Issa said. And she said, I'm sure you're misunderstanding what's happening. I'm sure that your aide in reality is really actually trying to help you and just doing her job. And besides that, we really can't say anything. We can't go to the administrators and talk about what's happening. Because if we do, we're just kind of like the squeaky wheel. We're complaining, and we're already hated. So all that's going to do is just make them hate us more. At that point, Issa knew that there was no hope for her. There was no one to protect her. There was no one to share the burden with her, that she was all alone. She became extremely suicidal. She would not be alive today 
uh, if it weren't for the fact that she has this severe disability that kept her from climbing into a chair, tying a noose, climbing up onto something so that she could hang herself, which is the way Micronesians commit suicide. So she was not physically able to carry out that act, but that's what, then that just made her even more depressed that she couldn't even end her own life. So what would happen then as she got older, she would fall into these deep, um, in, incapacitating uh, times of depression that would last for about a week, maybe two weeks, where she literally wouldn't be able to get out of bed, literally. So she would be in bed, wouldn't be able to eat, would have no self-care whatsoever, um, wouldn't be able to uh, do any schoolwork. And so this created an academic um, visual. In terms of you, if you looked at her record, she was very, very intelligent, one of the most intelligent, maybe actually the most intelligent person I've ever done counseling with in Micronesia. So she would, would have straight A's, and then all of a sudden you would see F's because she would disappear. She wouldn't be in class, and she would be, not be able to turn one thing in because she couldn't function during these bouts of depression. And so that is how she ended up in my counseling office, was a caring uh, staff at PIU, a professor, noticed that Issa had all A's, then all F's, then all A's, all F's. Well, you can't get away with that in college, at the college level, because you'll just end up failing. So the, the professor is very concerned and says, why don't you go and talk to Karen? So Issa comes in. This was very courageous. <clears throat> It's very hard for Micronesians to trust. Um, and so this was a newer student who didn't really know me. So this showed incredible um, courage on her part. So Issa came in, and uh, after hearing her story, I said to Issa, you know, Issa, I would like for you to picture yourself at a young age, like maybe, I don't know, second grade, first grade, during the bullying years. And so she's picturing herself, and then she blurts out, I hate that girl. So right then that told me that Issa had internalized all of the lies being fed to her her whole life, that she was not valuable, that she was not worthy of love, um, that she was, had, was not a cherished person. And the Bible says that Satan is a liar and a deceiver, and he comes to destroy and that's what I most, I love my, the therapy part of my job, is that I believe that when we take psychological best practices and you couple that with biblical and spiritual truth, it, there is a synergistic effect that is unbelievably powerful. It is profound. And I get to participate with God in that, um, that, that synergistic effect, watching that happen in the, in the counseling room. And so what I was doing during that work which was grueling work, sometimes three hour long sessions at a time, is trying to extrapolate those lies, get them into the light, because Satan wants to keep all that in the darkness. So working and working to get all that she had, all the lies she'd internalized, and to get that out onto the table, get it into the light, and eventually, Issa does begin to understand that she is cherished and loved by God. Again, this was not easy work, but um, it, eventually we got there. And during the last session that I had with her, I was doing a, a technique to lower trauma because this, she has not only all those lies, but actual P PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, as a result of extreme bullying and years of that um, on top of each other, multiple um, traumas. So I'm doing a, a trauma technique with her, and all of a sudden her eyes shoot open, and she says to me, I, I can breathe. Well, I think, oh, well, I sure hope so. <laughs> and, but she's like in awe and shock. I mean, it was all over her face. And she just keeps repeating, I'm, I'm breathing. I'm breathing. I can breathe. And she said, it's like for all these years, as young, like, like right when I entered school, I 
I haven't been breathing. It's, it's like my breath has been constricted. There's been chains wrapped so tightly around my chest that I haven't been able to take full breaths. And she's like, I, I'm breathing. And again, I, I just will never forget the awe and amazement and wonder on her face. And then she goes on to say, and it's like there was chains wrapped around my legs and my torso, and I can feel those chains, they're loosening, and some of them are falling off. So that was the very last session, very end of, the, of the, our time together. And as she gets up and walks out of my room, she was practically glowing, like radiating with joy and wonder and awe as she, you know, with her cane, makes her way out of the counseling room.